to introduce uh, today Jeff Hurst from Appalachian State University. Jeff is a, a sort of an older brother to me. He graduated from Penn State a few years before I started uh, my PhD studies there many, many years ago now. But he has been very active in uh, reverse mathematics, uh, viral disabilities, uh, all these kind of, uh, of areas. He's uh, well known with his PhD thesis. He really kicked out the combinatorics uh, the study of the reverse mathematics of combinatorics, but he has uh, done many other things over the years. So it's a, a real pleasure to, to have him here uh, to speak to us. Uh, and so I, I, I leave it to you, Jeff. And uh, I don't remember your title now, so I don't see it yet. And, uh, but, but you can talk about, uh, you, you can say it yourself. Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, let me go ahead and, and uh, start the sharing process. And so hopefully, hopefully you're seeing the slides now. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you today uh, a little bit about Binox theorem. I'm 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 very happy to have this opportunity and appreciate being invited to speak with you, uh, and and the fact that you're willing to come and listen to this material on a Friday afternoon, uh, which is really wonderful. Um, so, so some of this material is, is very old. So, so this note that, that Bonnock wrote uh, is actually from 1924, and it's a variation. He was looking at proofs of the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem and realized that if you had injections between sets sort of going in both directions, so you have an injection from A to B and an injection from B to A, that you can build this, this bijection between the two sets, so a one-to-one -one and onto map between the two sets. But when you build it, I mean, Schroeder-Bernstein just tells you that the bijection exists, but it turns out that when you build it, you can build it out of, of pieces of, of the, the initial given functions, right? So you're either using one of the injections or the inverse of the other injection. Um, so th this is this is an interesting theorem. Um, it's 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 nice to think about what H might look like. So I, I wanted to draw a picture of a couple of injections here. So I started out with some finite sets, right? And here's an injection going one direction, right? And then I have an injection going the other direction. So, so the F, F1 in, injection is pointing down. And then there's a couple of different ways that I could build a bijection from these two injections. And one way is, is to choose all of the up arrows. And the other way is to choose all of the down arrows. Of course, if the set's more complicated, you can have all sorts of mixtures, right? So if you think of this as being like one component, even with finite sets, we might have several different components and then we could pick, you know, the blue sort of bijection on part of it and the red sort of bijection on another part of it. So this gets more interesting when, when you have sort of infinite components involved in the situation. So here I tried to draw an infinite component. So, so again, we have one of the injection that corresponds to downward arrows and one that corresponds to upward arrows, right? And then again, we have a couple of different ways that we can build a bijection. One way is to pick upward arrows and the other way is to pick the other ones, right? And you can't, here you can't, if you're sticking within this component, you can't pick some mix because then your, your bijection might not be single valued or, or it, 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 it might not be um, actually injective, right? So sometimes, sometimes when you build these components, you get endpoints on them, right? So, so you can get endpoints in two different ways. So you can have a point here where F zero takes some value at that point. It has to take some value at that point. But this point 
in, in our set A is not in the range of F1, right? So that's one way that a, a, an endpoint can happen. And here's another way that an endpoint can happen. And one of the things that's really interesting about this situation is as soon as you've got an endpoint, right, you have to include this edge in your bijection and that determines everything else. And here you have to include this edge in the bijection. So we're gonna to have to use the inverse map here and that determines everything else in the component, right? So there's the situation on that top one with the low endpoint. And here's the situation for the bottom one with the high endpoint that we have to take these guys every single time. Right? So it turns out that, that this is actually sort of all the pieces that we need for an informal proof of Bonnock's theorem. Uh, so now we could sketch a proof if, if we've got our two injections, right? Then we can look at those components like we've been looking at. Here, let's go back and look at one of them. So if you grab some point, and I don't really care, care which set it's in, right? Then you can alternately apply the injections and go back and forth in one direction and alternately apply inverses and go back and forth in the other direction and it builds one of these components and the claim that i was making is that every point lies in exactly one component right so if we were going to make a detailed proof we might, might want to provide some more details there but that's correct right and then it turns out that, that we can define our bijection once we know that, right? If you've got a component where you have a high endpoint, let's back up again. So here's a component where I have a high endpoint. So I wanna define my bijection in terms of the inverse function. So if you have a high endpoint, then you need to use the inverse function and, and otherwise you can use the other function. You know, have to all the time, but you can, right? So that's that's a way to actually build that bijection from the two injections that you're given, right? So this this I don't know this this gives us a proof of the Bonnach theorem, and and consequently a proof of the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, uh, and it seems seems to me to be you know pretty straightforward. Uh, I've certainly read some proofs of the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem that I thought were less clear. Uh, in fact, proofs, proofs of the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem that were less clear that were written by me. And, and um, the one drawback here is, is that I haven't really defined what I meant by component because I could, I could like wave my little pointer here, right? And so I've left some details out and maybe that's why it seems like such a simple proof, right? So a long time ago, um, before Alberto even came to Penn State, I was working with Steve Simpson on some reverse mathematics. And one of the other professors there said, uh, oh, oh you, ought to, you ought to look at Bonnach's theorem. And, and so I did. And um, it was interesting in that setting because, because normally, um, well, more interesting than the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, because um, if you're just going to say, oh, I have, I have some injections between the natural numbers and the natural numbers in a couple of different, different directions, and so there must be a bijection, well, the identity function is a bijection, so, so Schroeder-Bernstein is not very interesting. But once you throw on the conditions from Bonnock's theorem that you're going to build your bijection, out of the information from the injections, it's a much more interesting theorem in the second order arithmetic uh, setting, right? So, so one of the results that was was in my thesis and then also in a later later uh, related article was um, this result that over RCA not ACA not is equivalent to the statement that's essentially a version of Bonnock's theorem restricted to injections on the natural numbers, right? And so down here also, 
um, rather than saying that that the bijection is either the first injection or the inverse of the second one. I wrote the fact that it could be the inverse of the second one this way, <clears throat> because that's more more amenable to the second order arithmetic setting. Now, in order to have this make very much sense, we probably ought to say at least a little bit about reverse mathematics. Um, I was told that the crowd here is is not doing reverse math on a daily basis. So let me tell you the little bit of reverse math that we're going to need in order to, to talk about this. So reverse math is just this program for studying the strength of mathematical statements. And we use a hierarchy of axiom systems um, that were, were proposed by Harvey Friedman. Um, and if you want a really good reference book, Steve Simpson has this book on subsystems of second order arithmetic that has just a huge amount of information about the subsystems and everything. So here's the setup. What we do is, is we have this language that includes variables for natural numbers and also for sets of natural numbers, but not for other sorts of objects, right? So just those two things. And then plenty of symbols for doing like arithmetic operations, like we can do multiplication of integers and addition of integers. We can talk about equality of natural numbers, right? And we can determine, we can talk about whether or not a natural number is an element of a particular set, right? Um, the symbols don't include equality for sets. That's actually defined separately. So there's a base theory, sort of a simplest, lowest level axiom system that we work in. And it includes basic, basic axioms for working with these arithmetical symbols and relations, right? A restricted form of induction, which, which we don't really have to concern ourselves with at all today. And the recursive comprehension axiom, which we will be using and, and will be concerned with. And the recursive comprehension axiom sort of informally asserts that computable sets exist, right? And you're well, you can use parameters. So if you're given some sets, then you can compute new sets from the old ones. And RCA not will tell you that these, these newly computed sets exist, right? So that's, that's the basic axiom system that's used in reverse mathematics most of the time. And then we add on additional set existence axioms or set comprehension axioms in order to build stronger, stronger uh, axiom systems. So, for example, the system ACA naught is RCA naught and, and an extra axiom, the arithmetical comprehension axiom. So it's a comprehension scheme for sets that are defined by <clears throat> formulas in our language that only have quantifiers over numbers. So no set quantifiers in these defining formulas. And so those of you that do, you know, computability theory would say, oh yeah, so it's the arithmetical sets. And that, that's exactly what's going on. It's a scheme that tells us that the arithmetical sets uh, exist, right? So let me back up here right, and look at the slide again now. So this theorem is saying, when we work in the base system, we can actually prove an equivalence theorem, right? And the equivalence is this arithmetical comprehension scheme and then Bonnock's theorem, right? So, so this is the sort of thing that makes us really happy when we work in reverse math is that we get, you know, precise correspondence between one of a handful of axiom systems and some theorem out of the literature, or at least a restriction of a theorem out of the out of the mathematical literature. And the amazing thing, I, I think the thing that we've been really surprised by over the past few decades is using this as the base system. There's, there's like four different axiom systems above that. And just a huge number of results turn out to be equivalent to one of those four axioms. Um, there are exceptions to that. But 
just a remarkable amount of mathematics it turns out to be essentially four theorems, if you want to think about it that way. So, uh, we have plenty of empirical evidence to support that at this point. So, in order to prove that theorem, we, we're, we've got an equivalent statement, and so we want to prove Bonnach's theorem in ACA naught, and then we'll want to do the reversal. So the first step is is carrying out the proof of the theorem, right? And and actually, the proof that we would probably use is the one that we've already discussed, right? If somebody gives us a pair of injections here, right, and we pick some number, then the component containing that number is going to have a high endpoint. So we had that one picture where we had a component with an endpoint and a high endpoint, right? And that only happens if you've got some sequence. So you could start and alternate and get back to get back to end, right? And the place where you're starting is something that's in the upper part. Right, so it's a high endpoint, and that endpoint is not in the range of the injection that points up from the bottom set, right? Um, so that's what makes it an endpoint, right? And also makes it a high endpoint, right? So if you think about this sort of expression, you might say, okay, so we're we're going to say that that there exists these these many things. Well, it's finitely many things, and we can code up a, a finite sequence as a single number. So we can think of that as an existential quantifier on the natural numbers, right? And then the rest of the formula, well, it's going to involve a universal quantifier, but this is a number quantifier again, right? And so it turns out that the statement that the component containing n has a high, high endpoint is something you can write down with an arithmetical formula, okay? Well, in that case, you can write down this, this definition for H of N using your arithmetical formula, right? And this function is defined by this arithmetical formula and therefore exists by the arithmetical comprehension axiom, okay? So it's, it's really a matter here of just analyzing the, the proof um, as, as we did before, right? So just sort of formalizing, uh, that proof. You, I guess, I guess it takes, it's, it's, it's good to say maybe something here because there's a lot of different proofs, uh, that you could give of Bonnach's theorems and, and some of them might involve some sort of complicated constructions of sequences of sets and things like that. And formalizing those proofs might, might not actually be as straightforward as formalizing the proofs that we've given. So uh, sometimes if you're carrying out this process, you have, well, you get to go exploring, you get to go and read all the different proofs that you can find of a particular theorem and see if there's one that would be good to, good to formalize. Okay, so, so now we wanna prove the reverse direction, right? So we, we had an if and only if statement. We were saying Bonnach's theorem is equivalent to ACA naught. We've proved it from ACA naught, and now we need to prove ACA naught from Bonnach's theorem, right? Well, ACA naught is actually a scheme, right? So it's like like the arith arithmetical comprehension scheme. And so you, you know, have to build stuff up over the, from all of these formulas. So we'd like a shortcut. And the main tool for the shortcut here is this lemma out of Simpson's wonderful reference, right? And it says that the following statements are equivalent over RCA naught, the whole arithmetical comprehension scheme, right? And then the statement is, well, if you have an injection, then its range, right? This set would be its range exists, right? So, um, that means all we have to do is, is use Bonnach's theorem to find the range of an arbitrary injection, right? And we will have our reversal to ACA naught, right? So, so there, there is quite a bit of legwork going on here. 
right? Getting this whole scheme out of just the, the claim that that ranges of injections exist is, is you know, not something that you can do in, in just a couple of minutes. It takes several pages of development in Simpson's book. But um, I'll, I'll leave the details. You, you can look them up there if you really want to see the details on that argument. Um, so let's 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 look at how we might do this. If we were given some injection G, how would we build the um, injections F0 and F1 so that when we apply Bonox theorem to them, we'll be able to decode the range of G from any bijection satisfying Bonox theorem. Uh, so there's there's a technique for doing this. And um, let's look at a, a situation here with sort of a sample uh, injection. So I'm gonna do the construction for a, a specific example, right? And then I, I hope that you'll be able to see that it's, it's a process that's easily generalized and, and computable in, in all of these situations, right? Uh, so, so the first thing that I want to do here is start sort of start building one component out of my collection of injections, and I'm building it on the positive powers of the zeroth prime. And I'm going to have this component give me information about whether or not zero is in the range of G. And when I do this, I'd like to build the component up only looking at a small portion, right? I, I want to do this in a computable fashion. So I only want to use a finite portion of the information here, a small portion of the information in order to uh, build each part of this diagram. Okay. So, so I'm going to start these diagrams off this way every single time for, for this, this argument. And I'm always going to have this this little this little piece here. So we're starting building a component with with a low endpoint, at least so far. Okay. And then I look at the information and I say, well, uh, g of zero is not equal to zero. And since g of zero is not equal to zero, I'm going to add this value on to, to f zero and this value on to f one. And then I look and I say, okay, zero hasn't appeared by the second stage, right? So uh, G of one is not equal to zero. So I, I tack another, another piece on here. And I keep doing this until I hit the situation where G of three is actually equal to zero. And because G of three is equal to zero, I'm gonna change the nature of my construction, right? Rather than putting another little little sawtooth on to my diagram, I'm going to take this point and have F1 match map clear back to here, right? And then I'm going to start building this way with F0, right? And from now on, I'll I'll do sawtooths that are going the other direction, right? Uh, so so zero has appeared here. One of the things that's really interesting is if you view this as a a component uh, that we're going to use to define the, the bijection, right? We just changed, we were starting in this situation where we had these sawtooths and we had a low endpoint. So we would only have one possible bijection that we could build out of it. And suddenly we changed to something with a high endpoint. So again, there'll only be one possible bijection that we can build and it's different. So now I want to consider the situation where I'm looking to see whether or not one is in the range of my function. Okay, so as I go through this, I'm never finding one, and I would just assume that I never find one. So I, ju I just build the graph out with these sawtooths all the time, and it would just go that way indefinitely, well, infinitely. Be assuming that one never appears in the range of G. Okay. So now we want to look for two. 
right? And two is going to show up after a minute, right? So we get that first sawtooth because it hasn't shown up immediately, right? And then we pull the same construction, but we're doing it earlier because two showed up earlier in the range, right? So you can see how that works. Um, and three actually shows up immediately. So here you build your first sawtooth and then immediately turn around and, and do that funny twist, right? And carry this out, okay? So you build one of these components on the prime power points like that uh, for, for each number that could possibly be in the range, zero or one or two or three and so on, right? And then of course we have lots of natural numbers which are not powers of primes. So if you have a natural number that's not a power of prime, you can define F zero and F one both to be the identity on, on those other numbers, right? And if you can construct all of these components this way, right? And then throw in those extra values, the identity function, then uh, we've got bijections from end to end, right? So we wanna think about what, what well, injections from end to end, right? Now we wanna apply Bonnock's theorem and find the bijection. And in each case, you know, uh, 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 an edge here that has the endpoint in the component has to show up in, in the graph of your, of your bijection, right? And in each of these cases, it also, once you've got that endpoint in there, it completely determines the, the definition of the rest of the bijection. So our bijection is going to consist of these green colored edges now. And you can notice something that's kind of funny here. If, if you look at a number like this, right? So if I look at uh, the zeroth prime to the first power and I apply the bijection to it, I get some number that's completely different, right? So it's, it's, it's pushing me way over here, right? And that happens every time that the function, that the value is in the range of G, right? And if the value is not in the range of G, it turns out that when you, when you take the bijection and evaluate it, you get the same number right back, right? So once you have the bijection, it's trivial to compute the range of G. So that's, this, I always think this is one of the joys of doing reverse math. I mean, it, it's so fun to take these, these mathematical ideas and do these constructions and think about how we're computing these different things, right? And then in the end, um, what, what you do is you wind up proving equivalence results that I think are really interesting. Um, I love these little pictures. Okay. So this is just to remind us that in the, in the situation where um, something is in the range that our bijection is gonna turn out to be the identity function and it's not when the number is in the range. Okay. So one of the ways that we can vary this is by restricting the functions that we're going to apply Bonnock's theorem to. And one way to, to, to consider this is, is to look at a bounding function. So a bounding function is just something that tells us how far we would have to look out in that table in order to figure out whether or not something is in the range, right? So, so really what the bounding function says is, if, if the situation, if n is gonna turn out to be in the range of the function, then you can look it up in the table sometime before the point bn plus one, <laughs> okay? So it's gonna show up by then. If you look that far out in the table and you haven't seen n show up in the range of f, then it's not in the range at all, right? So 
Um, that's a nice sort of thing. It's a little different from just saying, oh yeah, we're, we're gonna give you the injection and like a characteristic function for the range. So interestingly enough, in, in terms of RCA not, you could prove that the existence of the characteristic function and the existence of the bounding function is equivalent, right? And I'll, I'll mention that again in a little while. Um, so anyway, here, uh, I chose to use the bounding function. And here's the statement of Bonnach's theorem. So we're given two different injections, right? And we have a bounding function. You can set this bounding function up a lot of different ways, right? So you could have a bounding function for each of these guys. You know, you might as well take the max of those two functions. It will be a bounding function for both of them. So here I just set it up with one bounding function, right? And so this is just Bonnach's theorem, but only for injections with a bounding function, right? And it turns out that that statement is equivalent to this statement, we Kerning's lemma, which says that if you have an infinite tree where all of the nodes are labeled zero and one, so you can think of a, a tree, you know, branching up like this, right? All of the nodes are labeled zero or one. If it's an infinite tree, then it has to have an infinite path. Right, so this is a weak version of Kerning's lemma, a restriction of Kerning's lemma, which turns out to be equivalent to this restriction of Bonnach's theorem. Okay, so so let's talk a little bit about the proof of this. Right, so if I wanted to prove the bounded Bonnach's theorem in weak Kerning's lemma, really you use like the classical proof that you use for this sort of stuff. Right. So you're given your, your injections and your bound, right? And what we do is we build a tree that's gonna be, you know, possible initial segments of, of our bijection, right? And if at some point we get some evidence that one of our initial segments that we've constructed so far is no good, we'll just stop extending those branches in the tree, right? So, so you can think of this, Here's a sequence that's going up in the tree, some sequence of zeros and ones, right? And the associated uh, value for H that would go with this would be, uh, this is telling us which of the injections we're supposed to use to calculate H. So uh, H of zero would be F zero, H of one is also given by F zero, but then H of two in this entry would be given by the inverse of, of F1, okay? And uh, then we had a final zero there, so we put that in, right? So what we do is we the tree is actually like a set of codes for the sequences, and we throw the sequences in provided that they're consistent up to the length of the sequence, right? where that actually means the following. Um, first of all, if you're gonna pull this business, right, and define H in terms of the inverse, then you need to know that you can actually, you know, find that value, right? Um, and, and this is neat. We can check this very easily using the bounding function so we can compute whether or not that's equal to, that, that that's true, right? and check whether or not the sequence is consistent, okay? Um, we also need to make sure that the function, that the bijection that we're defining is gonna be injective. Um, so the F zeros and the inverses of the F ones will automatically be injective. We just need to make sure that if we define something with the injection function, that it's not clashing with one of the other values that we've chosen. And then um, finally, we need to make sure that H is on two. So that means if, if we have um, a component, right, and it's got an endpoint, and the endpoint is a, a, appearing be, before four, right? So, so our endpoints here are actually corresponding to natural numbers, right? So we're just looking at, at the, the first few things that might be endpoints. Um, if we've got an endpoint like that, then we're gonna include it in the graph of H, right? 
Uh, so, so you can't skip skip the endpoint. If you try to skip the endpoint, then your H will fail to be on to. Okay. Um, checking for these endpoints is also something that we can do in a computable fashion, thanks to the fact that we have this bounding function. So we know wh when things are in the range of the injections and when they're not in the range of the injection. Okay. Um, so if you build a tree up with these sorts of finite sequences in it, right, and uh, you can prove in RCA not that this tree will turn out to be uh, infinite, and uh, any infinite path through the tree will actually compute the bijection for you because it tells you exactly how to compute each particular entry. Okay. So this is this is again a very classical sort of proof in WKL not you build a tree of initial segments of something that you're interested in. So now we want to do the reversal. And if we're going to do a reversal to WKL not, right, we'd like some shortcut again. Um, here it's it's less important. I guess we could have directly worked with the trees, but it turns out that it's easier to work with this statement, um, which is uh, if you have a pair of injections and they have distant ranges, then there's a set that separates the ranges. So the whole range of G0 is going to be inside the set and nothing in the range of G1 will be inside the set, right? So we are actually giving ourselves the ranges of these injections. We're just able to separate the two sets, um, which is computationally less complicated. Okay. So to carry out the reversal here, if, if we've got a pair of bijections with disjoint ranges, right? Now we wanna construct banded injections so that if we apply Bonnach's theorem and get a bijection corresponding to those injections, we can use it to calculate a separating set. Um, so, so let's look at a couple of examples here. Uh, they give you a sense of how we would construct um, these, these bijections, uh, zero and one, right? So, so I'm going to look at, uh, the, the one prime, the first prime, I guess two is the zero prime. So the first prime, right? And, um, I'm going to build these injections on powers of three in such a fashion that they'll tell me whether or not I should put one in the separating set, right? Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and suppose that when I hit two, G zero two is gonna be equal to one, right? So that's gonna, that's gonna tell me that um, one should be in the separating set. Now, the organization of these numbers is a little different here. So I have the odd powers of three going off to the left and the even powers going off to the right. So the construction is a little funny in that way, but I need uh, a doubly infinite uh, component here in order to make this argument work, right? And uh, the construction of the components always going to look the same the same way. So it's going to start out with these sawtooths going off to the left, and the sawtooths always look exactly the same. And then I'll I'll keep repeating them, right, until I hit some number that's associated with two. And in this case, that that number is you know uh, six, I guess. <laughs> so I leave out this vertical link and go off this direction, right? And uh, what I've done here is ensure that I have a component with a low endpoint on the left-hand side, okay? So the other thing that could happen is I could have, say, um, three showing up uh, at some point in the range of G1, so I build the 
component associated with the third prime in the same fashion, right? But when I get to the number that's associated with one, right, um, then I leave out this, this slanty link, right, and go ahead and build the rest of my graph, right? And you can check here that, that these constructions, right, there's an arrow coming out of every top node, there's an arrow coming out of every bottom node. So I really am defining injections on the prime powers this way. You extend the argument out or extend the definitions out by using the identity functions again for F0 and F1 on everything that's not a prime power, right? And that constructs the injections for us, right? If G0, if, if you have some number that never shows up in the range of either function, you just keep building sawtooths indefinitely, right? And then your bijection could go either way, right? But again, we've got a low endpoint and a high endpoint, right? So when we when we look at the way that the, the bijections get defined, there's really only one option in, in these sorts of cases. There'd be two if if the number never showed up in the range, right? And again, if you look back at how the bijection acts on a particular um, prime number, right? So on the first prime, right? It gets set this way, right? So to, to a different value. And that tells us that we want to include one in the separating set. And down here, it turns out that when we look at the bijection applied to this prime, that we get the identity function. And that tells us that we want this number not to be in the separating set. So from the bijection, we can immediately just instruct the separating set um, af after our application of Bonox theorem to find, find the bijection. So I, I thought this was this this is an interesting topic for me. Um, and and you might say, yeah. So you're talking about results from from like 30 years ago, and and apparently just beating them to death. So so clearly you've lost it. You know, it's time to put you in the home, right? But actually, I had a reason to go back and look at Bonnock's theorem, and that's because I've been thinking more about higher order reverse mathematics lately, and. Higher order reverse mathematics is a little different from, from the traditional reverse mathematics in that the language includes all the, the finite types. Uh, so we have not, not just functions from natural, natural numbers to natural numbers, but we could have functions from sets of natural numbers to other sets of natural numbers or functions from sets of natural numbers to natural numbers, for example. So, so we get all these additional functions in it. Um, Ulrich Kohlenbach uh, set out a really elegant set of axioms for, for doing reverse mathematics in that setting in this article um, the, the, the cited in the bibliography. So it's in reverse math 2001. And um, I wanted to point out a few things about this axiom system without, again, you know, going too much into the detail. So, so it is based on functions rather than sets, which is kind of interesting. So, so when I talk about a functional from, you know, sets to sets, it's actually a, a functional from characteristic functions to characteristic functions. So you can think of everything inside as being some sort of a function. Um, again, if you look at the base system, it includes limited amounts of induction, some primitive recursion, a very restricted form of choice, uh, which, which becomes an issue, right? There's only so many functionals that you can really create. And, and um, that's actually a good thing, though, because it, it ensures that the system is a conservative extension of RCA naught. So if you can prove a statement uh, 
use, using higher order techniques in RCA and on omega. And the statement is, is a statement of, of second order arithmetic, then it's all, then, then you get, but it's a result of RCA not essentially for, well, not for free. You have to invoke this conservation result, um, which is mentioned in Kohlenbach's article. So, so one of the things that I thought was interesting about working in higher order reverse math as opposed to regular reverse math is a lot of times in reverse math, we're looking at these statements that are sort of A, E, or pi 1, 2 statements for every set X, there's a set Y such that some formula holds, right? And one of the things you can do in a higher order arithmetic is express this in sort of a scolomized fashion, right? So you can say there's a scolum functional such that for all X, the statement holds um for x and and the functional applied to x right and and this is pretty nice because this is this is asserting rather than being a set existence statement it's a functional existence statement and it makes sense in a theory about functionals to to look for functional existence statements right um and we can talk about the, the strength of these various uh, statements over RCA and hot omega, right? So here's an example of a, of, a, of a result. So Carl Mummert and I have been talking about this stuff and working with it for a while. Um, and these are preliminary results. I'm, I'm afraid I don't have, you know, polished proofs to hand out yet, but, but we, we have some, some proofs that we've written up and we're, we're working out all of the details. And so over this subsystem RCA not omega, uh, you can prove the equivalence of the following things. And one of them is uh, a version of WKL. Kohlenbach puts these parentheses around a, a functional letter in order to indicate that it's the principle asserting the existence of the functional. And, and I like that that technique. I, I think it's a neat thing to do. So um, this essentially says, oh, oh yeah, so there's there's a, a functional so that if you put in the the function uh, uh, the function corresponding to the tree and it's an infinite tree, then WKL of it will give you uh, the infinite path back out. Um, These functionals are total, by the way. So if you put in some set that's a complete piece of garbage here, or it's a finite tree or something like this, uh, the functional will still give you some sort of an output, right? So the principle only guarantees that that you'll get an infinite path in the if if you if you input an infinite tree. Um, and then let me jump down here. So this is this is the functional version of the bounded Bonnach theorem that we just talked about, right? And actually the proof for doing this, the proof that we walked through works very well. Um, it actually is, is a pretty good description of how you would compute the values of this functional and compute them in a way that can be carried out in, in RCA not omega. Uh, because I know there's people here that are interested in in viral analysis. Um, this is also equivalent. So, so it's essentially a statement that says that there's a realizer for uh, LLPO, right? And that turns out to be equivalent over RCA not omega to these other things, right? Um, when when Carl and I did this proof. Um, we like this a lot, and we like we like this realizer for LLPO a bit a lot because rather rather than doing those diagrams and having to worry about those prime powers and doing you know infinitely many components in the diagram, essentially you do it for one component in the argument, right? And then the associated parallelization parallelization essentially comes for free. Uh, so so it's really neat to work in. Um, these higher order subsystems, uh, very, very convenient sometimes. Okay. Um, 
So here's here's the version for the other version of um, the other restriction of Bonnach's theorem, Bonnach's theorem for n that we talked about today, right? And it turns out that that's equivalent to this E2, right? Which people have thought, you know, have, have said this is this is the analog of ACA not. Um, and and it also essentially asserts that there's a realizer for LPO, um, so you can think of it uh, in that way. And again, uh, you get to avoid messing with the infinitely many, many components in in the proof of the reversal if you do it in this higher order setting. So it's a a new and different proof. Okay. One, one of the other things that's really exciting about working with, with higher order reverse math is all of a sudden um, we, we can look at statements that we just can't formalize in second order arithmetic, right? So if I look at Bonnock's theorem um, for, for injections between uh, from a, a co complete separable metric space into itself, uh, where the injections are, are uniformly continuous, right? Uh, then then it, they ought to have uh, an associated uh, bijection, uh, just as in, in Bonnock's theorem. And if you restrict to complete separable metric spaces and require that the functions are actually uniformly continuous with a modulus of uniform continuity, then uh, Carl and I think we have a proof that that ACA not level statement um, gives you the Bonnach's theorem for complete separable metric spaces in this this situation, right? And and you can you can get the reversal just by using uh, the closed interval zero to one as your as your metric space or uh, using Cantor space, right? You do need compactness here. And we, we have some fragments of proofs uh, that we hope are gonna work out. And if you keep relaxing the restrictions, so if you if you uh, don't have uniform continuity, but maybe just regular continuity, or you work on a space that's that's not compact, right? Like bare space, we think you get stronger statements. So statements at sort of the ATR not level and, and at the PI11 CA not level. So we're kind of hoping very soon to have a whole list of versions of Bonnock's theorem that in the higher order setting marches through all of the subsystems from second order arithmetic, right? Um, this correlation between these higher order statements and, and the second order subsystems has been known for some time. So this, these, these are conservation results that you can find um, there's an article by uh, Sakamoto and Yamazaki that actually lists these two things, and they're they're listed there without proof, but the the proofs are essentially based on ideas out of uh, section eight of Befferman's article in in the um, Handbook of Mathematical Logic, right? And um, I think the same arguments. I mean, they they aren't they aren't as close to Pfefferman's. Uh, Pfefferman doesn't actually list these, right? But I I think that you can extend the same method and go ahead and and prove um, conservation results over WKL not and ATR not also. So this is this is part of what we're working for toward is to have a nice list of um, functionals, functional existence statements that line up exactly like like the uh, hierarchy of axiom systems in second order arithmetic. Okay, so here's some references. Uh, I'll make sure you could you could get access to these slides on my on my web page, and I will also make them available to the the seminar organizers if they like. And these are actually live links to the article. So if you wanna go back and look at the same sources I did, you're welcome to do so. That's it. 
site. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for what I think is a nice talk. So are there any questions or remarks? I have a very basic question. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, just uh, in your last statement, you have this, this uh, results about uh, compact spaces, compact metrizable spaces. Yes. And do you get uh, the bijection as the same complexity of the injections or it's, or it's a high verbal complexity? Or continue, I mean, you start with uh, with the uniform continuity of modulus M, do you get the same uniform continuity of modulus M for the bijection or not? Right, right. Actually, actually, there's an issue, uh, 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 something that's really interesting there, because when, when you talk about these continuous functions or uniformly continuous functions in the second order setting, Right, you sort of say, well, we, we, we would be able to express this because you can use these continuous function codes that we've always used in second order arithmetic. Right, but the difficulty is that even if those guys are continuous, then the bijection will often be discontinuous. Right, and we don't have any way to code that in second order arithmetic. So those statements that are related to the metric spaces and, and to, to continuous functions Aren't, aren't expressible in second order arithmetic. We're actually using the extra expressiveness of the higher order language in order to, to just state the results, right? And, and then in relationship to your, your question, right? So, so, you know, if you have computable injections, right? Those are, those are naturally gonna be continuous, right? And if your bijection turned out to be discontinuous, then it's not computable in some fashion, right? So, so yeah, you're getting a, a bump up in the computational complexity, right? Which is is not surprising. That's part of what the result is telling us in a way, right? Because um, we had an equivalence, right? To one of these other functional existence statements. Um, and, and, and so if, if we could like, like just yank or, or compute the bijection directly from, from the two injections, Right, then we could carry out the whole argument in, in RC not omega, right? And we would need an additional functional existence statement. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Let me ask a question myself. So when, when you're moving to this higher order um, reverse mathematics system of, of Kolenbach, uh, well, you are you are looking at this functional which you assume are total. So you, you underline this. I mean, even if the input is sort of incorrect, uh, you still need to output something, which obviously won't be a reasonable answer, but it's still something, right? Right. Instead, uh, typically when we look at viral reducibility, we don't put that kind of restriction. I mean, uh, we we work only with functionals or multivalued functionals. Uh, when the input is correct. So there might be a difference here. Did you try or did you, do you plan to try to, to look, for example, when you look at functional from the natural, still functions from the natural numbers to the natural numbers, you can form the sort of, the sort of viral functional and study the complexity of that, which given to two real injections will produce your bijection sort of a Banach style. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, so Carl and I haven't really talked about trying to do formalized virout reductions. Um, I mean, I've, I've tried doing some of that in the past, right? And, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting when we were working on this was this, this, this idea that the functionals needed to be total. Right. And, and the way that that affects the arguments and, and it struck me that it's not exactly like the idea of a total continuation for a Virac analysis. Right. But it's a little like doing a total continuation. Um, and, and, um, 
that was that was one of the things that, that appealed to me about working on these new arguments. So so here's something that you might be interested in that that really surprised Carl and me was if if you take that bounded Bonnock statement in the higher order system, right? And you say, oh, I'm I, I I don't want to use these bounding functions. I would rather use the characteristic function uh, for the, the the ranges of my injections, right? When you do that, it breaks the proof <laughs> because you want your function to be you want your functional to finish the to to halt the computation, even if you're getting bad information from your characteristic function or from your bounding function, right? Well, the bounding function, if you get bad information, then you just, right, you say, well, I haven't, I haven't seen this thing in the range of F so far, so it must not be there and you get on with your life, right? But if you have bad information from a characteristic function, you can say, oh, so this, this characteristic function is telling me that seven is in the range so I need to figure out where it shows up in the range and you start searching for it and 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 you get an infinite loop in your calculation, right? So so there's some sensitivity here to the formulation of the the results um, that that has been a little bit surprising, right? And I, I don't know. I mean, part of it, I, I when I first saw that, I thought, oh yeah, so no one will ever want to do more of this because it's just it's too dependent on the formulation. But then I thought, well, you know, I think I think that's what we thought when we first started working in RCA not too, that it was so everything was so sensitive, right? So if you're working an extension of RCA not, everything is still sensitive, right? But it's sensitive in a different in a slightly different fashion. I mean, you have to think about this, this totality issue and you have to be careful in your formula formulation of the results. So I think, I think this stuff is really fun. Other questions or remarks? Yeah, I think I have one question if I may. Sure, sure. So I don't know if you're familiar with the work of um, Takako Nemoto. Um, about 10 years ago, she worked on uh, so subsystems of uh, second order arithmetic and um, trying to get the strength of a subsystem in terms of a uh, determinacy for a very small class of Braille sets, like in fact, a uh, wage class, wage classes, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. um, similarly to what people do in set theory, where they get uh, determinacy for larger class than Braille sets, and they refer that to extensions of ZF. She would do that for, for mm -hmm. um, subsystems of uh, second order arithmetic. I was wondering whether uh, some of your results could be stated in terms of determinacy for a small class, or if you've ever thought of that, or if it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yes. I haven't really thought about that, but one of, one of the things that I, I'm interested in knowing is is you know going up beyond pi one one ca not, you know what's what's the right backbone here, right for these these higher order systems, right? And um, I, I I think a lot of the work that's been done in higher order systems so far. Um, it's very hard to compare the results. There's not a lot of equivalence results there, right? And so yeah. there's not that, you know, lovely linear structure, right? And and I, I some some people have been argue, arguing that, um, you know, the higher order reverse mathematics just it's 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 not going to have that linear structure. I think it may have more to do with with how how we select the results to analyze. Uh, so so if we're looking at you know reasonable restrictions, I, I I think we may see some sort of similar linearity or maybe multi multi dimensional things or things like that. And and we just don't know what the right metrics are to sort of go along in these different directions. So it could be that that 
this work that you're talking about would give us a way to specify one of the directions. So, yeah, I think, I think that I would like to know how it relates to this work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Well, let, let me ask a further question. When, when you, you, you were presenting your older results about the equivalence uh, of a basic, uh, let's say, Banach theorem with a say not, for example, I thought there was a, at least from your presentation, there was a gap. You were using maybe a sigma zero two formula or something like that to prove the theorem, and you were reversing to a, just a sigma zero one comprehension thing. I don't know if you, if you want to, oh. show back, to go back to those slides or uh, if you get what I'm saying, I mean. Uh, no, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And, and um, obviously yeah. now, now we have tools to, you know, sort of fine grain this kind right. of uh, gaps, uh, as, as you surely know. And, uh, and so I'm wondering also if there is room for maybe some, you know, final analysis of that old result of yours. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think the results could also be sharpened in that way. I, I, I expect you, you're absolutely correct. Right. And, and I mean, in, in, by, 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 by an approach to, right. Separate between those levels of comprehension. Also, like, like, I've never gone back and looked at any of this stuff in terms of like weaker base system, so RCA not star or something like that. I just, I haven't looked at it, right? Um, and, and yeah, it would be fun to look at all of this. Okay, any further questions or remarks? If not, I, I think we can thank Jeff again for his talk and- uh... Thanks for inviting me. And for joining us today with the Cross Alps seminar. I think we have a final session before the Christmas break next Friday. I don't remember the speaker now, but maybe somebody does. I don't know, Rafael, if you can help me here. Uh, no, sorry, I, I don't remember. No. Okay, well, there will be another speaker. Everybody will receive emails and uh, reminders for the next week talk. And uh, I thank Jeff again for being uh, with us today. And. Uh...